Hello and welcome to Face to Face. My name is Godfred Akuto Boafo. My guest today is a special one. He is considered one of the top most diplomats on the African continent. He has served as a deputy foreign minister and has also served as a secretary to the president. He is considered one of the most skillful negotiators in international politics. Ambassador Thomas Kwesi is our guest on Face to Face. Welcome to Face to Face, Ambassador Kwesi. Thank you. Ambassador, you must relish the chances you get to visit home these days. <laughs> Actually, it's true. It's always a pleasure to be back home. You don't realize how much you love Ghana until you leave it. The moment you leave it, you start to miss it. So I want to thank you for the privilege of coming back home. I want to thank His Excellency the President, the Honorable Minister for Trade, for giving us the invitation and affording us the opportunity not only to come back home, but to come and participate in this event, which in our view is a very important game changer in the history of Africa. You, you, you are a career diplomat and for a lot of people it's a fancy job. It's a job a lot of people get up and say, I want to be a diplomat because yeah. you get to travel. Was that always a vision for you as a young man, to be mm. a career diplomat? No, actually, I, I got into the foreign ministry perhaps by accident. I, I trained as a lawyer in law school, so I wanted to practice law. And even before I got the foreign ministry, I had an appointment to be an assistant state attorney. Mm. Now, I was more interested in the civil international section, but I was instructed to go to Tamale as a prosecutor. Now, I'm not very interested in prosecuting anybody. So when foreign affairs came around, I jumped at it and I had the early privilege of working with a very distinguished ambassador, Ambassador Beho, who literally trained me and allowed me to go on my first conference, non-aligned conference in 77. I don't think you were born then. <laughs> but by the time I came back from that conference, seeing Marshal Tito, seeing Fidel Castro, seeing my mind was made up, I knew this what really I wanted to do. And I've done it all my life and I've enjoyed it. It has given me the chance to travel, Sometimes there are disruptions to your family life, but it's a really big privilege to be able to serve Ghana in this capacity and to I, serve the world. I look at the countries you've served in, the places you've been to, Cairo, you've been mm -hmm. to Brussels. Mm -hmm. That's Germany, right. Like that. yeah. How does one adapt? Because you're on the move regularly. No, personally, as uh, an official, adapting is easy. But for the family, because... Uh, I got married. I, I, my first travel was a diploma, I was a bachelor. And I went to Kotonu, and there was a young lady working for the Ghana Airways office. So we just connected, and within a, a year, I was married. I had a child. My first child was born in Kotonu with a, what they call card de naissance, birth certificates, Benua birth certificates. But since then, I, I've got. Uh, transferred to Cairo, I did a bit of Cairo, midstream, came home, went back to the legal department and then went to Bruxelles as an um, officer dealing with EU negotiations with Africa. From there I came home, I had the privilege to be a charge affair in Havana, Cuba, from where I was transferred to New York to be the deputy permanent rep and dealing with international legal matters. There was on the sixth committee of the General Assembly dealing with all those international commission of juries aspects and that was very a great education. I was actually in um, I had arrived in New York a couple of weeks or a week before 9-11 hit. So New York was very traumatic for me. But from New York I came home and um, later got appointed to London's Deputy High Commissioner from where I was appointed ambassador by His Excellency President Kufour. In comes Prof Mills after the election, he also endorsed me. I stayed in Addis for four years, chairing basically the committee, subcommittee on administration and budget. That's a key committee. So after four years of that, I came home. Then a young minister had been appointed, Madam Hannah Tete, and she asked me to be her deputy. I was very privileged. From there, I was uh, conscripted to serve the president as executive secretary in the Flagstaff House. Now, I went to Flags that went from Flags that I went to India for an Africa AU, AU Africa strategic meeting. 
and there was a delegation from the AU who wanted to see the president. We had a long discussion. The next day I had to go to give him some papers from President Francois Hollande. We were preparing for COP21. And President Mahama told me, Chris, sit down and talk to you. They just come from Addis to tell me that you're a good ambassador and that if you stand, you could win. Because of this history of Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana and AU integration. I said, but uh, you know, uh, and I've been on retirement, you gave me this job, I cannot come and... He said, no, no, you have my support. So he endorsed my, my, my candidature. The rest, you can say, is history. Fantastic. Yeah. And you mentioned your family. How, how, how has Audrey been? Audrey's your wife. Audrey, Audrey's been supportive. You know, Audrey was an air hostess. So she has uh, experience in hospitality. She likes to cook. So in all my career, she always inviting people. You know, the diplomatic career, the sort of entertainment that you have to do. You have to meet people, you have to welcome them, you have to have parties, you have to have receptions. She does that very well. And I believe that part of my, what you would call, modest success in this job has been because of her support behind me. I have four wonderful kids, uh, all ladies born in my travels. Mm. The first one is a lawyer in, um, in Indiana. She just got married, so I just went to hand her over. Ah, congratulations. The second one um, is an accountant. She has two kids. Twin daughters, identical twins. I'm born in Accra. <laughs> I'm both medical doctors trained in Cuba. Mm. Interesting. So I've been lucky. I asked around about you. Mm. You know, and in all the circles I ask everybody says Ambassador Kote is a skilled negotiator. With the current job you have, you are deputy chair of the AU Commission. Mm -hmm. It must be a very useful skill to have considering well, where the continent finds itself. Well, I don't know about being a skilled negotiator. That's what they tell me. What I can say is that I've been a, a civil servant and uh, I've tried to steer, to read and study. I enjoy international relations. But I've had the benefit of working under some extremely competent people that's in my luck. I worked with Ambassador Gbeho, I worked with Ambassador Kato, who was my boss in London. I worked with Ambassador Efa Pinti, who was my boss in New York. I worked with Ambassador Bankwa, my boss in uh, Brussels. He's a, a science graduate with a very articulate and precise mind. He taught me how to write with precision. So what one has learned through the people one has worked with, the foreign ministry is a, is a great school. It always was since we were there because we have very distinguished ambassadors from the Tanquao, Henry Sechi, you know, the whole lot of very, very solid material. We have people like Kofi Annan who are in New York to look up to and learn from. So one can say that uh, the educational system of Ghana, the prestige that the country has, which I don't think Ghanaians do realize. People respect and love Ghana a lot. I hold democratic experience. The, the, the opportunity to have worked with uh, President Kufuado as my foreign minister, the opportunity to have worked with President Mahama as my direct boss, the opportunity to have worked with Madame Hannah Tete, Mrs. Aguirre Lins. All these have been part of one's formation. Of course, I was always a hockey player, so I played hockey all through Achimota, I played for all Achimotans. Through that, I got to know President Mills very well. He taught me international trade law, taught me legal ethics, taught me company law. Professor Sawyer, Dr. Kwesi Bochi, they've all been part of our formation. Chachu Chikata taught me jurisprudence. They gave me the chance to work with the chambers and learn from him. So it's been a, a total experience. That and has uh, molded you to be as good as they say you are at this job. <laughs> and it's an interesting time. I want to yeah. spread the yeah. conversation a bit. Uh, I look at Sudan and the AU recently mm -hmm. negotiated successfully yeah. Yeah. Uh, a peace deal between yeah. The, the civilians yeah. and mm. the transitional That's right. How did the AU manage to sidestep previous mistakes that they had made in such situations? Well, I don't know about sidestep. You could say learning from your mistakes. You know, when problems come, they don't come well articulated. They may come as a little spark here, an Ebola incident here, but you always have to be alert and seek to anticipate the problems before they do arise. You also have to keep in your mind and follow the history of those countries through their developments, through independence. If you're able to do that, 
and you're also able to network and make connections. Almost all the time when problems arise, you always have somebody who can give you a brief history of the place. Through the history, you can begin to vision out the potential possibilities of the solution. Mm. So, in a way, all problems come with their solutions embedded in them. I mean, the Chinese say that every problem is an opportunity for great joy. So if you listen carefully and you make friends and network around and make sure that you are transparent and uh, inoffensive as possible, mm. people generally tend to want to support you. Because so these were the things that you did in Sudan? That is how our world has been operating with Sudan, with the CAR, with all the other international problems. You always have to use the history, you have to, have to consult the interest groups, the powers. You have to maintain contact with all the groups, the United Nations, the Security Council, the African group, and see where you can navigate safest. So, are there lessons that can be taken from what the AU has been able to do in Sudan? Because it, for a lot of international watchers, it was a, a, a pretty touchy situation looking yeah. at the yeah. importance of Sudan. Yeah. If you got it wrong, it could have yeah, we, been problematic. Yeah, yeah, but we had we had links. We, ha we have we have had discussions on Sudan with the U.S. State Department. The Deputy Secretary of State came to see us in Addis Ababa. We discussed issues with the Jeremy Hunt when he was a foreign minister. He was in Addis Ababa as well. He invited us to London for further discussions. It's it's about um, reaching out and keeping contacts. It's about taking account of the historical antecedents. It's about having an open mind and uh, following the laid down regulations and the general law of the Constitutional Act, which seeks to build an Africa secular, democratic, independent, transparent, at peace with itself. That also means being in touch with the people on the ground, having you to be seeking to, to, to build up, as they have done in ECOWAS, a people's African Union, African Union which relates directly to the people. When you listen closely to the people, almost, almost invariably, the answers are embedded in their ideas. Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, has this led to, can we say therefore that it's part of a larger strategy to manage current and future conflicts? This. Yes, and 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 and, 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 and first of all, EU. first of all, also to manage yourself as a, as an institution, we we we, we recognize the African Union Commission is the only vehicle, continent-wide, recognized internationally, which is responsible for implementing the objective and instructions of our heads of state, our assembly, our sovereign body. They give broad general instructions, right? It is for us now to identify the instructions, their implications, and how to translate that policy into workable legislation, workable individual administrative measures to bring it to the ground, to bring it to fruition. It's about being able to grasp the essential elements and contours of policy statements given you by authorities, which are generally the, the sentiments of the broad population of Africa, and try to bring them down into practical, workable, pragmatic decisions and moves to make them really work on the ground. For instance, this CFTA, in 2011 or 2012, Ghana was asked to host the ministerial conference on intra-African intra trade. And then, uh, because we hosted the intra-African trade conference, we now had to host the summit. So Prof Mills had to come and give the keynote address. Now, in his keynote address, you know, Prof Mills was a professor of international trade law. He taught me trade law, actually. He laid out the contours of the CFTA, the free movement, the common passport, the common central bank, and all these ideas are essentially from Kwame Nkrumah, Africa must unite. The ideas which are related with Ghana. So, when 
it came to, first of all, the decision to have the secretariat installed. That, was, that decision was made in 2012. And along the years, the question now came as to who to host it. And I suggested to Ghana, this is, a, this is something that we could host. Because we don't have any AU institution here in the first place. As the president has said, Ghana has contributed a lot to African liberation, African integration from 57, from Kwame Nkrumah through all the presidents. In particular, President Kufuadu, who is very much a committed Pan Africanist. I mean, when I was a deputy, deputy high commissioner in London, I used to go meet him for the airport, take him to all his meetings. And all our debates are about practicalizing African integration. So it's a bit fortunate that he's a person in charge now. He has taken it and he offered a very attractive proposition for Ghana to host it. He organized a vigorous campaign, ably aided by the Minister for Trade, who mobilized all the dignitaries in Ghana, including Otufo. And it spread across Africa, negotiating, campaigning, cajoling, and finally this matter has come here. And it's uh, you can even call it poetic justice that this has come to Ghana. I, I think that uh, the nature of our political, diplomatic, Koshta evolution made Ghana probably, probably the best place for this place to be. The challenge is now for us to make it a going concern, make it something that will transform not only our economy, our regional economy to transform the continental economic configuration and this is a historic opportunity and I feel very privileged to have been associated however vaguely and distantly with it. It's interesting you mentioned the CFTA. It's not the only initiative that has been pushed out. We also heard of the single African air transport market. Yes, they, they are linked. But it's, we don't seem to have seen as much traction mm -hmm. on that as we have with no, this no, one. They, What's happening there? They are all linked. The key thing is the CFTA. So once, once it once moves, have, it once will affect once, once they have the, the CFTA customer. moving, it's going to affect the transport, it's going to affect the free movement, it's going to affect the common passport. They are all related. You see, because uh, what, is, what, 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 what is free movement? Is that having a passport, which you recognize everywhere, mm -hmm. that nobody's going to ask you for a visa to go to Togo or to go to Cameroon. So the, what we have to be concerned with is how to get all the national associations to agree on the common design, uh, which will be computerized. So you can produce in the various countries identical travel documents, which are African-owned, African-centered, and truly, truly African. Okay. We are doing it at the moment at the, at the diplomatic level. The challenge now is to reduce it to the general level, so the African people will begin to see that we are really the same. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I'm optimistic because I've, I've studied a bit of the history and I know that the division of the continents, 1884-85, was externally generated without any consultation with our people. That is how the nation state, the borders we have today, were created. So these borders were created by man. We have been divided into different language groups. But our common Africanists still exist. I went to a funeral, our uh, director for economic affairs, an Ivorian, died. So I led a delegation to Cote d'Ivoire. To my surprise, the whole service, the whole ceremony was conducted in three. Mm. Wow. And when I, I told the president, I said, no, but there are as many trees speaking Ivorians as there are in Ghana. Because the migration originally originated from Asante Mine all across. So you find that. We are the same people, for some reason or other, have been made to believe we are different. The same with Ghana and Burkina, the same with Ghana and Togo. And this replicates itself across the continent. Okay. It's fascinating. So we have a culture which links us together, mm -hmm. which facilitates our integration. Speaking of which, we, that will lead us to migration, movement and all. And illegal migration has been a big yeah, yeah. Illegal what, the, what, what are we doing about this? Illegal migration truly is a challenge. What does it show? Illegal migration shows that our youth are impatient. They are determined to look for a better world. They see it all on television. 
they are not ready to wait for 100 years. The challenge to the African governments, to African political elites, is to formulate the institutions and bring the institutions to such a, a, in such a level that it can enhance the living conditions of our people and get them to begin to think and have hope that you can have a good life living and working in Africa. What the CFTA does and can contribute to this is that the CFTA suddenly opens up the investment potential of the continent. Hmm. You know, uh, investors want to know that they have a large market. They can produce, they are produce, they pro their produce will be sold, then they can make their profits. They want to know that they have an institutional environment which secures their investment. They want to know that there's transparency, that their money will not be stolen. Once you establish that, and they begin to see the results of the AFCTA on their investments, you know, nothing succeeds like success. The, the, the movement becomes geometric, yeah. uh, becomes dialectic. And so it gathers a momentum of its own. And that's what we're beginning to see. Well, but that is a good hope, but mm -hmm. at the moment, what the world, however, see are the thousands of bodies yes. being pulled out of yes. the sea and whatnot. Yes, yes. Does the AU have anything in place? At the, the moment, the, there's, to uh, help there's an, alleviate this. There's an immediate challenge, and that is uh, trying to address the traffickers, trying to arrest them, trying to disorganize them, trying to develop stronger state institutions so that the migrations, the illegal migrations, become less haphazard. That's the, at the immediate level. There's a medium term in trying to have. Uh, boats around the Mediterranean trying to ginger up the European colleagues to assist in arresting the situation when it occurs. But the longer term depends on the improvement of our political and economic situation within the continent. That's the longer term. You are watching Face to Face and our guest is the Deputy Chair of the AU Commission, Ambassador Kwesi Kwote. Face to Face will be right back. Welcome back to Face to Face with Ambassador Kwesi Kote. Ambassador, let's talk peace and security now because it's at the forefront of a lot of minds, even in Ghana and other parts of the continent. Let's start Nigeria, Boko Haram. Mm -hmm. you, you know, uh, first of all, let me, on peace and security, let me refer you to an axiom that uh, is associated with UNESCO. UNESCO says, War or conflict starts in the minds of men. Mm. So it's in the mind of men they have to begin to forge peace. What does it mean? Just look at the situation in Africa today. A lot of uh, economic strife. Talking about Nigeria, Lake Chad, yeah, North the Chad Nigeria, Basin, around yeah. where. This Boko Haram, the Haram thing seems to have started and been concentrated. The Chad connects Chad, Nigeria, Cameroon, a few other countries. The Chad used to be a thriving water body, providing agricultural possibilities to all the countries surrounding it. The Chad now is suddenly dried up, and dry up over time because of the weather, climate change, and all that. All those people who whose livelihoods depended on Lake Chad, suddenly, are without a job, without means of uh, sustenance, struggling, their children cannot go to school. Introduced in this situation of desperation, a fiery preacher who starts to blame everything on government. Don't go to school. Education is an evil. You begin to form the minds of people and propagate make them victims because they believe everything he says. Now, if you have all these who are educated or are in school or are in thriving businesses, you'll be less likely to absorb the admonitions of reckless fanatics. So education becomes a key in the long term. In the short and medium term, 
we have to find a way to control the harm that these people have done. I mean, some of it might be military, some of it might be political. But in the long run, it's education and economic development. But is the AU involved in it? Absolutely. The AU is very much involved, the peacekeeping forces, the organizing, the, the countries around it, negotiating with the World Bank and the US government, the EU, to provide sustenance to help get the military force in place. In the longer term, the AU is helping to direct negotiations. There's a possibility of canalizing water from Central Africa all the way to feed the waters into Lake Chad. And that is a, a major civil engineering project that's also been negotiated with many big countries and many big banks because they already began to see its potential. Um, normally, you'd have said that some of this would be private sector generated, but it's the private sector. They only begin to do things when they see immediate profit. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you need public uh, institutions to set the stage and do the heavy lifting. And then the, the rest of it, organization, the management, the profit making can be left to the private sector. So it's a public-private thing. There's a need for governments and the totality of African governments, represented by African Union, to relate directly the, 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 the larger banks. So when they see that there's possibilities of big government supporting it, they lay the foundation for the private sector to run away with it. So that's the way we are doing about peace and security. And uh, you know, peace is complicated. The, Africa was divided by powers. There are inter-tribal warfares, there are interstate wars, there are also wars have religious connections. But at the root of it all, is the lack of hope, which is a result of lack of economic development, lack of livelihood, bad governance in some instances, that uh, leads our people to desperate measures, which sometimes cause us so much grief. But there is hope on the horizon. All is not lost. Ghanaians are beginning to get a bit wary, and because Al Qaeda used to be so far away. Mm -hmm in the eyes of Ghanaians. Now they hear there's Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. Then That's they hear right. Mali. They hear Burkina Faso. Right. And they hear, well, maybe Benin. It's or crossing the border. Closer and closer. We, we, are, we are worried and we ought to be worried. But I think that our, our best security lies in good governance, economic development, transparency, and democracy. And that we have. And that may well be what has kept our country out of any serious terrorist attack for the time being. But we need not rest on our hours. There's a lot of work to be done. We have to assist our neighbors as well, because when your neighbor's house is on fire, you have to start looking for bucket to help him, because from there he's coming to you. So the, the problems are interrelated, but they're historical, they're long-term reasons why Africa is the state that there is in. It's important for us to address that history and the provenance of our problems today, the better to look, see the solutions. Uh, Churchill, Churchill used to say that the further back you look, the further forward you are likely to see. Uh, Confucius, the Chinese philosopher, says that uh, if they want to divine the future, I must look into the past. So history has a lot to tell us. And our history as a country shows that we are very proud, determined people. We just have to appreciate what we have, and I believe the future is very bright for us. So there are these ones, and then there are the three, you know, the three horsemen that won't go away: South Sudan, DRC, Somalia. You know, why is the AU struggling to contain the conflict you know, in this place? South Sudan, I think we are finally getting the root of it. They have a transition government now, which has the support of all the sides. All we need now is to support South Sudan. Mm -hmm to become stable. It's a country which has wealth, oil, gas, and organize it properly. It's about organization. Congo, you know? The DRC. The DRC is at the heart of the continent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me about it. The DRC it. is the center of the continent. It's the center of the chessboard that is Africa. And the DRC has been unfortunate it's been too rich or too wealthy for
for it so good. The DRC was destabilized at independence. You must have read about Lumumba. Mm -hmm. Because the DRC happened to have had the raw materials for the... They have everything. They have everything, but they, they have, have some everything. of the key raw materials. They had, in, in the 60s, they had this uranium. Mm -hmm. And all the great powers, that was at the time of the Cold War. Yeah. The great powers were anxious that to get the raw uranium. That uranium should not fall into the wrong hands. Right? And the stakes were so high that they were ready to destabilize this poor African country, the richest, the biggest, and make sure to make sure that they have the right puppets in control. And they had General Mobutu. We all know what harm mm -hmm. that did. Uh, so the history has much to tell us. But the stakes in the DRC, now they have the, some of the most important minerals, cobalt. Yes. The rest for the Meba Buba food industry and the rest. So we have to focus our attention and make sure make sure our the governors, now they've had a good election, they have a governing power. All we need to do is to help to stabilize the Congo. Because you see, without a strong state, without an effective state. And what is a state? A state is uh, an entity with a central authority. That means you must have a central military and police authority. Then you have a state. We have several other factions competing for authority in the place, two or three armies. We don't have a state anymore. We have a civil war. So what we should do is to help the Congo develop a strong state are they interested in developing a very much state? so this uh, new president chitakedi is a democrat so what the au needs they to use do, confidence in absolutely him? what we're trying to do now is to support them you see there's a lot of um, you may call it ignorance we were talking we've been talking about ebola in the, for the past four or five months we found a situation where even the people we have sent from the au to go help to tackle the bull in the Congo, get attacked. Their stations get bent down. It's as a result of ignorance. There's so much ignorance that they see those who are coming to help them as their enemy. So it means that both the UN, the AU, and all the international WHO, we have to focus and arrest the situation in the Congo. Because now that it has hit Goma, it could spread around the continent. We have to mobilize the efforts like we did in West Africa. When President Mahama was chairman of ECOWAS, I was working with him. He went to Sierra Leone. And his presence there highlighted the seriousness of the situation. And the international community came in. They saw that the answer was not to isolate, but to come and help people get volunteers. And we, we're in the process of doing that now. We're a little late, I believe. Mm. And uh, they're still having that meeting that we made some errors. But I believe that we are on track to address this. And we need the assistance of the whole international community, the business community, the, the youth and people to help us put Congo together. Because Congo is the heart of the continent. And if we get the heart right, we'll be fine. If we don't get the heart right, no matter what we do, we'll be in trouble. If Congo is the heart, Somalia must be the doorway. <laughs> <laughs> Somalia <laughs> must probably the right hand or the left hand. But you know, Somalia again. It's like another situation. The Somalia AU again, the history of Somalia with. also shows you the importance of having a central authority. Um, I don't know how long you are, but Somalia used to have um, a, a president, Siad Bari, mm -hmm. military man who stayed for too long, refused mm -hmm. to go away. He attacked Ethiopia. Just who attracted support from Cuban troops, mm -hmm. and Cuban troops being supported by the Soviet in the Cold War, automatically attracted Americans in Somalia. So they, were, they became proxy wars. It went so long that it destabilized the whole country. And after the American helicopter Black Hawk was shot down, the consequences, they all left. So the factions were left to their own devices and fought themselves down to the extent that piracy became the most thriving business you could have heard about piracy along mm -hmm. the Indian Indian finally now we're putting Somalia back together again 
we are slowly getting to form a national army, a federal army. It's a very tough job trying to put a state together. Expensive too. Expensive, but we have no choice but to go with it. Even though every now and again, we should receive setbacks by bomb attacks, bomb blasts and the rest of it. That should not deter us. We should, we should, we should, we should keep going. I, I will tell you a story. I remember I was at the AU summit. I was in Ambassador in, in, in Addis. In, uh, we went to a summit in um, Kampala. Now, we had a visit from the U.S. Secretary of State for Africa Affairs then called Johnny Carson. Mm-hmm. Prof. Bills was president then. He came to try and get Prof. Mills to agree to get Ghanaian soldiers to intervene in Somalia. He promised this the whole world. They said that Nigeria is refusing to go because they want Ghana to go first. Prof. Mills told them, I've sent my generals to Somalia. They've done the reconnaissance work. And they say that there's no peace to keep in Somalia. When you establish the peace, we will come and assist you to maintain. That's what a peacekeeping force is supposed to do. You know, immediately they went to persuade Kenya, went to persuade Uganda. And I think Uganda and Kenya sent troops there. Within two months, there were terrorist attacks in Nairobi. Then it began to dawn on me how much we were saved by Prof. Mill's refusal to be pressured to get Ghanaian troops to go to Somalia. We sympathize and support the Kenyans and Ugandans for the work. They've done excellent work. But what I'm saying is that you have to analyze the problem at length from its roots and look at the what is in it for you, what's in it for the continent before you step in. And all that depends on good leadership. Mm-hmm. And it's leadership and vision. That's like it took us forward. We don't have all the solutions, but we have to keep on trying at each and every step because we cannot afford to give up. It's the only Africa we have. How are things coming with getting that African standby force? It's, 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 it's fairly well advanced. It's not in one location, it's in different, different, different places. Mm-hmm. But the essence is for it to be interoperable. We have a lot of meetings between our high commands, between the armies, they train together. And uh, we had a lot of Ghanaian officers in, in Addis Ababa advising on air transport and air safety and the rest of it. It is not, you could say, not physically in existence yet. But you're always able to mobilize troops from, from various nations because the, the heads of states and then the Peace and Security Council is always coordinating with them. There's room for improvement, but we are on our way. All right, then. You are watching Face to Face with Ambassador Kwesi Koti. When we return, we will enter the final phase <coughs> of our interview and we will have a conversation in that segment about AU and the rest of the world. Welcome back to our interview with Ambassador Kota. I must say it has been very enlightening so far. Ambassador, AU has a lot of interest and other organizations have interest in the AU as well. What is the relation between the AU and the US like these days? Very good. Very good. You know, I, I had a meeting in uh, Washington on Agoa mm. trade. And uh, the U.S. Uh, representative for international trade was chairing the meeting. We were then negotiating the final phases of CFTA, its relations to Agoa, and how it sits with WTO. So the the ambassador Lighthizer begins by saying the CFTA we are seeking to introduce. It's against WTO rules, and they're not going to support it. So I told him that we have to look at it from more than just simply trade and exchange. We have to look at the history of the United States, its relations with Africa. 
I took him back to the history of the slave trade, the exportation of so many Africans into the United States, the beginnings of the diaspora. I took him back to the Haitian Revolution, the first uh, successful slave revolution in history, the first black states in the Western Hemisphere. About the attempts, I took him about the attempts of General Napoleon and the rest of those who had interest in maintaining the slave trade to try and suppress the revolt in Haiti. How, after all the efforts, they still failed. And then I reminded him that because Napoleon had fought so long to try and suppress the insurrection in Haiti, he got so broke, he was obliged to send Louisiana Louisiana was French, by the member of the United States. He was obliged to sell Louisiana to the United States. And that's how the U.S. became one contiguous territory. He was, was, he was un wondering what was Israel was said. That is Africa's contribution to the territorial integrity of the United States. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. That's the history. So what we are seeking to do in Africa today is what you did in the U.S. in Philadelphia in 1797-87, when the Confederation came together to put on the Constitution of the United States. So we're seeking to create a United States of Africa in the same way that you created the United States of America. So actually, it is your interest in as much as ours to hang a wagon onto yours. So we'll move together. You are the best example for us because you are the one country which was brought together by one idea, singleness of purpose, life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness a country based on the notion of rule of law and democracy. And it's an example that we are seeking to follow. He said, well, why do you know that? So he got interested. That's how we won them over. And after that, he sent his Secretary for Commerce to Addis, later sent the daughter of uh, President Trump, Ivanka Kim. They're now seeing the potential that Africa has because of its integrative process. It is the process towards integration that has made Africa suddenly attractive. Mm. You remember the Chinese came to build headquarters for us. We were yes, complaining. I was to that. We were complaining. Immediately the Chinese built the headquarters, he sent a message to the rest of the world about how important they believe Africa is. Immediately after that, or the how German we can lay a foothold in Precisely. Africa. Precisely. Immediately after that, the Germans came to build a peace building. So what I'm saying is that the more serious you get, the more seriously people take you. That doesn't mean that doesn't absorb you from doing your homework and making sure that whatever is given to you, you put it to the best of advantage. And also to make sure your back is covered, even as you do the negotiations. And the mm. only way you can do that is by increasing your knowledge, increasing your commitment, increasing your democracy, increasing your temo, uh, transparency. Have you an Africa where every child is in school? Have you an Africa which is numerate and literate, which is able to absorb and utilize technology and science, capital? That's the way that we can jumpstart and move forward as a continent together to achieve the vision of a vibrant, democratic Africa at peace with itself of the world. So what do you say to those who are afraid of the way they feel perhaps that the AU is being pulled in different directions? Russia wants a piece of the pie. China wants a piece of the yes, pie. Yes, the yes, US yes, wants yes. a piece of the pie. EU wants a piece of the pie. It's a legitimate yeah. worry. But uh, what is the answer to it? The answer to it is better organization, better realization of science and technology, better involvement of our people, making the AU more relevant to our people and getting them to have a say in it, getting the AU closer to its people. And this conference here today in Ghana, with the involvement of all you young people, the involvement of the people together, the question they're asking shows you that finally, the people are getting interested in the AU. And once they're interested, they start to ask questions that will compel leaders to sit up and continuously begin to improve in whatever we're doing. We are open. You can question us, you can criticize us. That's the only way to make improvement. People have to be critical. 
and we are to believe that these policies that you talk about are truly independent and African and not being pushed you can by check. another territory with their you, own you, you, you agenda. Can check. You can check, but you can be sure that uh, nobody is coming to help you because they love you. They come to help you because they know that you have something that they are interested in. It's up to you, it's up to us as a continent to do our homework, to cover our backs, to negotiate with an open mind, and to negotiate with a positive spirit. But we need to also increase our knowledge and our technical ability, our political ability, our democratic experience. All that comes into play. And my final question, do you get a sense that there is a change in political will? Because in all this, without political will from various mm -hmm. African leaders, mm -hmm. You don't make any progress. I know, I know. I, I, sometimes I wonder what you mean by political will. I think that the fact that 44 African countries, heads of state, signed the agreement on the first day, that they have ratified it ahead of time, itself is demonstrative of political will. What I think is a problem, rather, is how to manage ourselves in such that we can bring these lofty ideas that our forefathers had from Kwame Nkrumah way before then, mm -hmm. through President Kufu, for President Kufu Adu. How to make that lofty idea a reality? Ghana, we own aid. We have to systematically reduce the lofty policies into practical, pragmatic, little activities, little actions on the ground, administratively, to bring it alive. That is the test. All right, then. Thank you very much. The jury much. is still out. <laughs> Ambassador <laughs> Thank Thomas Kisikoti, thank you so much for your pleasure, time. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Uh, you heard the deputy chair of the AU Commission, Ambassador Thomas Kisikoti. I like mentioning his full name. He likes to call himself Kisikoti. <laughs> you know, uh, very, very modest man. But I hope you enjoyed this episode of Face yeah. to Face. My name is Godfred Akutoboafo. Have a good day.